Listen, we're in uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 10. I figured somebody would have said amen, like we're getting close to the end. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Only a few more weeks to go uh, out of uh, this book, and then I'm extremely excited about where we're going next, but I'm not sharing that with you uh, just yet. I'll let you know in the coming weeks about uh, what's happening after the book of Ecclesiastes. But uh, this morning we make our way, we're getting in towards the conclusion now. Uh, We find ourselves at the beginning of chapter 10. So chapter 9 ends with a focus being placed upon uh, the value of wisdom. And chapter 10 opens with a a warning to, to stay away from folly. Folly is the op- opposite of wisdom. And so the preacher picks up right where he left off in chapter 9. Uh, he ends in chapter 9 making the statement, one sinner destroys much good. And so never afraid to tell it like it is, the preacher, the author who, who wrote Ecclesiastes, opens chapter 10 with a powerful image. Look at that, verse 1. Dead flies make of perfumer's oil stink. So a little foolishness is weightier than wisdom and honor. I I love looking at this uh, verse at different translations. Uh, The King James Version uh, sounds a a little bit better, uh, but smells about the same. Uh, The King James Version uh, says, uh, Dead flies uh, cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. Uh, Then leave it to the New Living Translation uh, to give us a real clear picture of what this verse is. It says, as dead flies cause even a bottle of perfume to stink, so a little foolishness spoils great wisdom and honor. The imagery is so strong that we can almost catch a whiff of this foul perfume. Although there was nothing wrong in the fragrance in and of itself, at least originally, it had attracted a swarm of flies. And some of those insects had died, and the stench of their dead bodies had turned the perfume rancid. This is illustrating the damaging effect that folly can have upon a person. All it takes is one rash word. All it takes is one rude remark or one hasty decision, one foolish pleasure, or or even one angry outburst to damage and destroy a long, consistent record of wisdom and honor. It only takes one. The preacher offers a word picture to imprint this truth into our minds. And so he he says there's an expensive bottle of perfume. But somehow, in some way, flies made their way into the bottle. They drowned themselves in its liquid, and their dead bodies float to the top. And suddenly, what was once valuable was now worthless. Its purity has been corrupted Its usefulness has been destroyed by the presence of dead flies. In the same way, one senseless or impulsive mistake, just one, can can sabotage a person's reputation. It can damage their influence. It can destroy their testimony. It's a sad fact of life, but it's a fact nonetheless. And so the preacher is speaking again about the importance of a good name. He started this illustration really talking about a good name back in chapter 7. Chapter 7, verse 1, he compares a good name to that of a precious ointment or, or costly perfume. Here he continues the metaphor. Here he stresses the fact that just one senseless act can destroy a person's good name, often ruining their reputation and honor. And so what dead flies are to the perfume, folly is to the reputation of a wise person. And so the conclusion is logical. Wise people stay away from folly and foolishness. And I probably should have pointed out 
the, from the beginning, but I'll point it out now. Chapter 10 kind of takes on the tone and the feel of kind of like chapter 7. It feels like it's a proverb. In fact, there are many proverbs in chapter 10. There are proverbs, there are short stories, there's case studies, comparison, exhortations. But through it all, the preacher's making a clear contrast between two entirely different ways that we can live. There's either the wise way or the foolish way. And so as we work through this passage, the question we ought to be considering is, am I living wisely or am I living foolishly? And as we reflect upon that question, we need to understand the difference between wisdom and folly. And so in order for us to understand the difference, we need to really understand the biblical definition for folly or, 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 or for fool. You see, that word fool in the biblical sense is not necessarily someone with a below average IQ. No, folly does not always show up on the low end of an IQ scale. No, rather the term folly refers to someone who lacks the proper fear of God. You see, without the fear of God to rule their lives, then the fool is prone to go in the wrong direction. Scripture tells us in places like Psalm chapter 14, verse number 1, it is the fool who says in his heart that there is no God. I think if you want to get a good understanding for folly and for foolishness, I think the best place perhaps that one could turn is the book of Proverbs in and of itself. Proverbs is, hang on one second. All right, let's try this. Another distraction. We got new headsets. I don't like it. It's just all over the place. So I'm going to try to, to, to manage this. I feel like I should have a hanky in the other one and just. Okay. Let's recapture this, okay? If you want to get a good understanding of foolishness and folly, I think the best place for us to turn to would be the book of Proverbs. In fact, within the 31 chapters of Proverbs, that word fool is found 37 times. If you expand that to include words like folly or foolish, foolishness, and foolishly, it goes from 37 times to 97 times. Now, Instead of us walking through nearly a hundred scripture references in this moment, I've narrowed it down to six. Now these six don't capture all of it, but I think it gives us a, a clear picture of what it looks like to be a fool or to live with folly in our lives. And so let's start in Proverbs chapter 10, verse number 14. It says that wise men store up knowledge, but with the mouth of the foolish ruin is at hand. And, and so here, King Solomon contrasts the speech of the fool with the knowledge of the wise. You see, a fool or a foolish person doesn't care about learning because they're too busy talking. They can't stop talking long enough to listen and to learn. Later in, in, in chapter 10, down in verse number 18, he says, Then he who spreads slander is a fool. And so the fool will speak poorly of other people. We know Scripture testifies to the fact that death and life are in the power of the tongue. But the fool is the one that will use their tongue to damage and destroy others rather than to encourage and build them up. If you should find yourself on the receiving end of a slandering tongue. May, may, may the words of Charles Spurgeon be an encouragement unto you. And when dealing with receiving slander, he said, the best way to deal with slander is to pray about it. God will either remove it 
or remove the sting from it. Our own attempts at clearing ourselves are usually failures. Be quiet and let the advocate plead the case. A beautiful, beautiful uh, word of encouragement there. And, and so the fool talks more than they're willing to listen. Uh, the fool doesn't control their tongue in, a, in an edifying way, but uses their mouths to damage and destroy other people. Still, uh, we find ourselves in, and still in Proverbs chapter 10, uh, in verse number 23, it says, Doing wickedness is like sport to a fool, and so is wisdom to a man of understanding. And so, I would say that a foolish person does not take sin seriously. Uh, the fool fails to seriously consider the consequences of their actions. In Proverbs chapter 12, verse number 15, it says that the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who listens to counsel. And so the fool uh, rejects advice from other people. The fool is the one that refuses to listen, to receive, or to follow the wise counsel of other people. A fifth example is found in Proverbs 13, uh, verse number 16. There it says, a wise man is cautious and turns away from evil, but a fool is arrogant and careless. So in contrast to the cautious actions of the wise, a fool is both careless and reckless in their actions. They rarely consider the impact that their actions or their words have on other people or even upon themselves. And then to make matters worse, as if you can, a foolish person is arrogant and proud of their wrongdoing. A final proverb on the matter, Proverbs 26, verse number 11 says, like a dog that returns to its vomit is a fool who repeats his folly. So rather than repenting and refusing to engage in a sinful behavior, no, a, a fool is known to return and repeat the same sinful actions time and time and time again. Now, in addition to this, these six verses from Proverbs, right, uh, the preacher has already told us many things to describe a fool. Going back to uh, chapter 2, verse number 14, there we see that the fool walks in darkness. In chapter 4, verse number 5, the fool folds his hands and consumes his own flesh. In other words, a foolish person is a lazy person. Then in chapter 7, verse number 9, it says, For anger resides in the bosom of fools. And so now in our text this morning, the preacher is going to add that the fool is also directionally challenged. Look at verse 2. It says, A wise man's heart directs him towards the right, but the foolish man's heart directs him towards the left. And so this verse defines folly with a short and easy to remember contrast. And in fact, literary scholars would, would call this an antithetical proverb. Okay, so uh, left handed people out there, anyone? A few? My apologies to you. Not, not, not trying to be offended to the left handed individuals in this room. But you need to understand that the, the Bible generally treats the right side as the good side, right? The right hand is the hand that is associated with strength. It is the right hand that, that saves, supports, and protects. The right hand was used to convey blessings. It is the right hand that is associated with authority. That's why Colossians chapter 3, verse number 1, tells us that Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. Right? And so given this background, it should not be surprising to us that at the final judgment, you see the scene painted in Matthew chapter 25. At the final judgment, the, uh, God will separate the, the sheep from the goats. Right? So it shouldn't surprise us that the sheep are at the 
right side of the father, and the goats are separated to the left. And, and so what the preacher says is that the foolish man's heart directs him towards the left. He's telling us that the foolish person is going the wrong direction in their life. Which ought to challenge us to consider what direction are you going in life? Are you moving in the right direction? Are you moving towards the things of God? Are you going in the left direction? Are you moving away from his word, away from his will? Are, are you moving in the right direction? Are you moving closer in your relationship with God? Are you going in the left direction? Are you moving further away from him? Are you moving in the right direction? Are you growing closer in your relationships with other believers in Christ? Or are you going in the left direction? Are you growing deeper in your own isolation? Which direction are you going in life? Only a fool chooses to go in the wrong direction. Notice the reason why the fool goes to the left because his heart, his heart is directing him in the wrong way. See, the heart is the core of a person. The, the heart makes up the totality of an individual. It is the innermost part of every person that either loves God or does not love God. Everything in life, all that we do, all that we say, flow from the heart. So our scripture tells us, like, Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20 through 23 says, My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your sight. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to all their body. And then verse number 23, Proverbs 4, says, Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it, flow the springs of life. Other translations render it uh, like, uh, above all else, guard your heart, for it affects everything that you do. You see, the wise person goes the right way because his heart leans in the right direction. The foolish person goes the wrong way because his heart leans in the wrong direction. You see, wisdom and folly are inclinations of the heart. Jesus contrasts uh, the foolish with the wise in Matthew chapter 7. He says this from verse 24 to 27. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, the floods came. And the winds blew and slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. Then rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall." See, we are encouraged to, to hear God's word, but we don't just stop at the hearing. We're to hear the word of God and to do the word of God. That's James chapter 1. So we must not stop with the hearing. We don't stop with the studying of God's word. Our hearing must result in our doing. That's what it means to build upon the rock foundation. So Jesus' true followers, his true disciples, not only hear his words, but they act upon those words. See, true believers allow the word of God to make a difference in their lives. They allow the word of God to change how they think, how they speak, how they act, how they live their lives. So question, like, which direction is your heart leaning today? Are you leaning to the left or are you leaning to the right? Uh, are, are you feeding and feasting on the word of God? 
Or are you leaning to the left? Are you becoming more and more biblically malnourished? Are you leaning to the right? Are you getting more serious about addressing the sin in your life? Are you leaning to your left? Have you stopped pursuing personal sanctification? Like, Which direction does that heart lean? Understand that the leaning of your heart determines the direction of your life. The fool is on the wrong way. He's on the wrong road completely. But sadly, according to verse number three, the fool doesn't even understand it, doesn't even realize it. Look at verse three. Even when the fool walks along the road, his sense is lacking, and he demonstrates to everyone that he is a fool. Uh, The fool doesn't have to walk around and literally cry out, hey, I'm a fool, I'm a fool, I'm a fool. No. His words and his actions communicate to the others that he is indeed a fool. I love reading through various pastors and their their understanding and interpretation of certain passages of Scripture. And one pastor, J. Vernon McGee. Anyone know J. Vernon McGee? Amazing man of God. Notice what he says about the fool. He puts this position quite effectively. And he's talking about how the corrupt heart shows a person's lack of sense. And this is what he says. He says, a fool does not have to carry a placard on himself that says, I am a fool. The fact of the matter is that all he has to do is open his mouth. Sometimes he doesn't even have to open his mouth in order to prove that he's a fool. You see, through the course of living our lives, through the course of the day, our words and our actions bear witness to the condition of our hearts. So because a person's heart determines what that person will do and what that person will say, therefore it is foolish behavior is the fruit of a corrupt heart. I want you to consider Jesus' words that are given to us in Luke chapter 6. Verse 43 of Luke 6, it says, For there is no good tree which produces bad fruit, nor, on the other hand, a bad tree which produces good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they pick grapes from a briar bush. The good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth what is good. And the evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth what is evil. For his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. I hope you can understand really the application of uh, Ecclesiastes 10, 1 through 3 is really simple. A little foolishness contaminates and can inf- infiltrate every part of our lives. Therefore, we must guard ourselves against foolish behavior. See, one of the reasons why the Bible defines the difference between wisdom and folly is so that we can choose the proper way to live. So my encouragement to you today, don't be the fool. Don't be the fool. Don't be the kind of person who refuses to listen and respond to the word of God. Don't be the kind of person that refuses the wise counsel from godly individuals. Don't be the kind of person that erupts in anger every time something goes wrong or sideways in your life. No, instead, incline your heart. Instead, direct your heart. Instead, turn your heart to God And ask him for the grace to walk the right way rather than relying on your own strength and walking the wrong way in life. I love how the Bible uses that word walk as a metaphor to describe our our, our Christian faith. You see, the Christian life is a journey. Therefore, we are to walk right? We are to walk. We are to make consistent forward progress in our faith. We're not to sit in our faith. No, we're to walk in our faith. 
That's why Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 1 says, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling for which you have been called. That word worthy has the idea of matching up. In other words, it's saying that our actions should match our words. A better way to say it is the outward presentation of our lives should match our inward convictions. So to walk worthy of our calling means to live up to our calling, to live up to our name and our identity as a Christian, a Christ follower. Live our lives in such a way that we honor and glorify God in all that we do and all that we say. This journey that we are on is a walk. And we're to consistently be making progress forward in that walk. Like, let me just point out the obvious. Like, look around. Right? No, really. Like, look around. See the people. May you understand Hopefully, we're all on the same journey. Hopefully, this room is filled with Christ followers. Some of you aren't. I get it. I know. So the the prayer for you is that you would submit and surrender your lives unto the Savior and that you could begin this Christian walk, this Christian journey. But for all the other children of God, and you're on this walk of faith, know that we're on the the same journey, but we're not at the same place. You see, some of us are a little bit further down the road in this journey, and some of us are, are a little bit further behind. Some of us have been on this journey for decades, and some of us are just now beginning this journey. Right, So as God's children, we should be loving, kind, patient, encouraging with one another on this journey of faith. As we learn to walk, we should be encouragers. Right? Think about a, a, a little infant, right? a toddler learning to walk. Right? What do we do? How do we do that? Right? We, we set them up and they stabilize their legs, right? and maybe they'll take uh, one step and fall right? They don't take one step and fall. We don't scold them. We don't reprimand them. We don't say things, I knew you would fail. You're such a disappointment to me. Why? We would not do that to our children. I hope we wouldn't. No, we encourage, we celebrate. Good job, you did good. Maybe, maybe next time we'll get a little bit further, get a little bit further, right? But why is it as children of God, and that's how we respond to each other? They fell. They stumbled. They messed up. Right? Why is it that when they stumble, they fall, and they mess up? Why is it that we're so quick to just betray them or to ignore them or to ostracize them? We should be rallying behind them. Can't get back up. Get back up. Let's go. Come on. we got to keep on walking. Keep on going. Dust yourself off. It's time to keep growing. May this church be a place that encourages one another in this journey of faith. I can't help but just to think of those that used to walk with us. Now they're not here. Some of them have moved, literally. Some of them have started going to other churches. Ah, But the vast majority have just stopped attending any. Think about the verse, do not forsake the assembling together as some are in the habit of doing. And we have those that have walked with us that are forsaking the assembling together. We should lovingly receive them back into the fellowship. And if you know them, if God should put them upon your heart, then reach out to them and encourage them. Be encouragers and uplifters. Use your words to speak life, to bring healing. And we already live in a negativity-filled world, right? We don't need that here. May we love one another. May we serve together side by side. And when, not if, 
But when one of us stumbles in our walk, may we encourage them. And may we help them make it a little bit further down the road next time. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the, for the encouragement of brothers and sisters in Christ. God, help us to be strong encouragers one to another. Help us to understand the difference between wisdom and folly. And God, may our hearts lean in the right direction. May we choose to, to, to direct our hearts to the things that please you and honor you and glorify you. And God, may we not mess around with foolishness. May we stay clear of it, Father. Help us. As we respond to your word, Father, God, help us to be honest and true about who we are and what we need in this moment. And I pray that you are pleased by the response of your people. We commit this time to you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.